Hello, welcome everybody to the next episode of RM Sotheby's Car Show. And uh, we are coming to you live from Monaco. It's a beautiful sunny day. Uh, we have the ocean just a few yards from us. And for those of uh, you who are not having the benefit of uh, watching this in glorious Technicolor, I can tell you that we are sitting in a large room. It's called the Grimaldi Forum. It's a big function space in Monaco as I say, right on the edge of the ocean. And we are surrounded by all of our Monaco sale cars. Right behind me, we've got a Ferrari 330, a blue one. Uh, what else have we got? We've sort of got Group C race cars. We've got four, a Formula Junior, um, oh, all sorts of stuff. And, and a really fantastic collection of road cars. So anyway, um, Monaco is a biannual sale. So we're here every other year. And the reason why we come is because this is the weekend of the historic Grand Prix at Monaco. So they've, uh, out in the streets around us outside, it's actually really hard to get around Monaco this weekend because pretty much all the roads are closed. All the grandstands have gone up, there's Armco everywhere, and they've effectively got the city ready for the Formula One Grand Prix, which is in a couple of weeks from now. Ahead of that, they do the historic Grand Prix. So that's for a wide ranging, uh, selection of uh, historic race cars from pre-war uh, to relatively recent uh, F1 machinery. It goes what, up to when about? Early the 80s. Early 80s. So over the course of this weekend, there's a lot of people in town, a lot of drivers, a lot of collectors, a lot of people here who are just here to see the racing. So for us, it makes a lot of sense for us to have an auction here. And we did our first one in 2010. And I love it here. I really love it. This is a great venue for a start, but the atmosphere and the weather is always fantastic. Uh, so I'm here with today's partner in crime, car specialist uh, Felix Archer. This isn't your first Monaco sale, or is it? This is my second. Your second Monaco sale. Because we did the sale in 2018, and then that thing happened in the world, um, and yes. so we had to miss the, the sale. Yeah, we, we, uh, we haven't been here for a while. And where do you think the Monaco sale rates in your kind of favorite or not favorite auctions i i really love it um it's really I mean, it's very high end um it's arguably our flagship european sale um there's some incredible kit and this sale in particular um i can't remember an auction when we've had this kind of lineup we we were very lucky that we have some amazing cars come through the auction block um but this year in particular there's some incredible kit um you know and there's a lot of sort of poster on the wall cars 507 um great Formula One cars, the 340mm, 275. There's there's so many great cars uh, in the sale, so it's fantastic. Yeah, there is, I, I agree. And it's relatively unusual to have as many cars that have quite such the same level of historical significance. I think that's the thing, isn't it? So the obvious question to ask you is, what is your favorite uh, lot or lots of this sale? It's very tough because I'm, um, I'm a huge Porsche enthusiast, um, and there is an amazing 2.7 RS lightweight in yeah, the sale, is, which is yeah. one family owner from new. Um, original which, paint. Original paint. Um, it's not just a 2.7 RS lightweight, which is already very rare. Um, it's a car that's been in one family and loved and looked after, um, and it tells a story. But if I was to choose my favourite, it would be the Williams FW14, because that tells a lot of stories. So, yes, yeah, so we have got a collection of cars offered by Ni Nigel Mansell, haven't we? And uh, featuring two Formula One cars. Uh, the Williams FW14 from uh, 1991 and uh, his Ferrari 640 from 1989. But the, the Williams is the car for you, is it? Not the Ferrari? It is, because I just remember seeing historic footage um, of that car. And it's not just that, it's this chassis going down the straight alongside Ayrton Senna, sparks flying, edging closer to each other, banging wheels at 200 miles an hour. And it's, it's completely crazy that that is the car. Um, and how many times has a car come f directly from the driver having not turned a wheel since its last race? That's amazing. Yeah, I, I, and I, that's, in a way, that is the thing about the Ferrari and the Williams, is that try and think of another opportunity that you're ever likely to have beyond this auction, where you can buy one or other of two race-winning Formula One cars driven by a world champion 
and buying them from that very world champion. I mean, that that's kind of... I, it's never been done before, I don't think, and it's probably unrepeatable again, would yes. you agree? Yeah, and, and, you know, we often joke um, and say, you know, find me another one of these when we're talking about cars in our auction. But genuinely, find me another one of these. It's so hard to find... This, this situation and this scenario and the context is... Uh, I don't think it's ever happened. Um, so it's... Yeah, it's very exciting. Yeah, and the, the, the Ferrari is an interesting car because it is 100% complete, right? That that rolled out of a truck or out of Maranello uh, and has been untouched for all of that time. Probably You could probably look at any nut on that car and the last person to touch that with a spanner would have been a, a Ferrari mechanic, which is an incredible thing, isn't it? There's a transport uh, document in the history file um, and if anyone sort of you know qu queries the provenance, there's a transport document from the factory to Nigel's house, the beginning of 1990. Yeah, it's it's bulletproof. It's amazing. And of course, the Williams doesn't have an engine, but that was because Renault uh, took all the engines back at the end of the season. Um, but it 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 could be made to run, right? That car. It could, and if whoever makes it um, a running car again um, has got a car that's eligible for everything and um, there's a new series called ignition grand prix which is reviving these cars from the late 80s to the mid 90s um, and you can use these cars again um, and they're becoming much more cheap to run um, obviously you know it's not like turning up at an amc club race but it's you can drive these cars um, and the great thing you know again that nigel's willing to help the next owner um, get dialed in um, and you know, there's a new life for these cars, which is amazing because there's so many people that grew up with this era of car, um, and the fact that some people are lucky enough to actually drive them, it's great to see them again. Because whilst whilst people collect cars to you know to look at and put in a sort of museum, I think we all want to see them being driven again. And to see a car like that go up the hill at the festival festival of speed would be would be amazing. It would. And I, t I was talking to Nigel earlier, and he said something that I thought was quite interesting because I said, how do you feel about selling the cars? And he said, well, you know, I'm passing them on to a new custodian, but he said, I'm always going to be connected to these cars. So he said, although they're not going to be in my ownership, I'm always going to be connected to them. And he's absolutely right, because 10, 20, 30, 50 years from now, they are always going to be the X Nigel Mansell Williams FW14 and the Ferrari 640. Just as we talk today about the X Fangio this or the X Sterling Moss that or uh, the X Schumacher, I mean, those, those cars will always have their his name attached to them. So I think that's quite nice if you contextualise it like that. Um, it's easier for him to part company with them uh, because I, I think it's... It, Talking to him, I think it's been quite an emotional journey for him taking the decision to let them go, don't you? Absolutely, and I think everyone that's owned a car um, for a very long time, uh, or a car that's been in a family like the 2.7 RS, you you know you have so many memories attached to them, and Nigel in particular has so many memories involving these cars because you know he created the history. Um, so it's it, it's a particularly hard decision to make. Um, but as you say, it's now time for someone else to, to enjoy them. Well, if I, if I was going to um, take custody of a car here today, I would I'd be, and I'm not saying this just because it's the most expensive car here. Are you sure? Well, no, I, I am sure? sure. And quite obviously, it's the one, well, it's one of m many cars in this room that I will never, ever in my entire life be able to afford. But the, th the Ferrari 340mm that we have uh, is, an, is an incredible piece of machinery as well. Uh, one of four Vignali bodied 340mm spiders uh, out of a production run of 10 340mm's. And the last time uh, a Vignali spider like that came up for sale was 10 years ago. So it, that's a once in a generation. If you've got the money, it's a once in a generation opportunity to buy a really special car. And that, that car, you know, the 340mm won Ferrari a World Sports Car Championship. So it, historically, it's a very, very important car. Uh, and it's a beautiful thing, yeah. But you are. Uh, this is an auction where we're sport for choice, for sure. We are, and there's even there's a there's a green nine to eight in the corner with a Pasha interior, um, and I I think it's important not to overlook that car because that is the car. It's also the conveniently the only car I could actually afford in this sale, um, but it is 
just incredible and it's got ridiculously high mileage but it's the coolest thing um, and I think that's going to be unfortunately the one usually if there's a car I'm interested for myself which is never um, it always goes skyrocketing so it's very so exciting. So you reckon you might have a chance? No I have no chance because if I'm in, yeah it, uh, well I'll, uh, maybe maybe my hand will go up but it's um, no it's it's too cool. Somebody once asked me this morning in fact have I ever at one of our auctions ended up by owning a car that was have you? No, um, I did end up a, a few years ago here, we had a big collection of Ducatis, the Saltarelli collection, and it was about 100 Ducatis. But it wasn't just big Ducatis, there were all sorts of sort of weird little Ducati scooters, 50cc things from the 60s and 70s. And I did end up by buying one of those. And that, that was simply because the auctioneer the auctioneer decided that I should be the person to own one and he just pointed at me and said and brought the hammer down and said so congratulations, you, congratulations now own. you now own it and that was it yeah but given that we've got such a, a Formula One vibe going on here and we're in Monaco which is synonymous with Formula One racing uh, I mean we've got two Formula One cars for sale that are of uh, roughly the same era aren't they Eight, uh, 89 and 91 is, what's your, is that your favourite era? What's your favourite era of Formula 1? It's incredibly difficult because there's sort of, each era is, I think is defined by the drivers. So right now we're in the, you know, the Lewis and Max, well we're in the Lewis and Max era. Um, and then there's the Schumacher era and Alonso and then the Schumacher and Hakkinen. Um, but looking back and seeing who drove in that era, you have Senna, Prost, Mansell, Piquet, it's it's got to be it's got to be maybe the best era um, I think the cars particularly in the late 80s early 90s you had the introduction of the real coke bottle design um, and I think I prefer the non-turbo era as well uh, the fact that these cars were I mean the the, uh, the 89 season was normally aspirated um, and such a clean design um, and they were wrestling the cars. I mean, it was so unbelievably dangerous. Um, I think it was a great respect between all the drivers um, and so many iconic moments. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's got to be up there. Yeah, I, I mean, I would agree with that. And I, I, although I do have a real soft, I mean, if I was in the market to, to own a car, I might go back to something like a Lotus 49 uh, because I, I've got- Because you want more danger. Because I really like flimsy cars that mm. are going to be a danger to my life, mm. number one. Secondly, I just love the fact that, you know, particularly the 60s, before cars started sprouting wings and spoilers and, you know, all of the aero, they were basically just cigars, weren't they? They were cigars with four wheels poking out at each corner. And you sat in the fuel tank. And you sat in the fuel tank and, and it sort of was a, it was a, it was a, like a kamikaze missile, wasn't it? Yes. And. Uh, I, but I love them. I just love the purity of design. Um, but yeah, it, it wasn't a safe era for Formula One. If you were to sure. choose one Formula One car to drive out of the entire history of the sport, what would it be? That's a really good question. Oh, I, I'm going to go really left field on this. Not, not. I mean, I'm going. To, I'm now going to go way back in time. I would really love to drive a Mercedes W125 Silver Arrow. That is a long way back in time. You know, 30s, a 200 mile an hour car, a car capable of the sorts of speeds in a straight line that Formula One cars today are doing uh, in the 1930s. You know, that is incredible. Those in the auto unions, uh, I think, just must have been phenomenal things to drive. And, and, and back in the day, to have seen those racing, it must have um, so that's a that's a drone. That's a drone. Cars. That was literally a, just buzzed past my ear there. Um, Imagine if that broke and hit the 340mm. Yeah, that's a bit of a concern. Um, so yeah, I, I would like to go right the way back to those methanol fueled supercharged Do you just have a silver thirst arrows. For danger. Well, no, because I'm, I'm going to drive it really slowly. Right. You I'm just going to I'm going to poodle around the Nurburgring at maybe 30 miles an hour, and then just say I've done it, <laughs> and just speed up the footage. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> like old Pathé news. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> uh, so, what would you? What about you? Um, the, the problem is, is, I think the era that I'd like to drive 
I'd make such an embarrassment out of myself. Because these cars, you have to drive fast to actually get any performance. I don't think I'd ever get any heat in the tyres or the brakes. So it would just be shocking. I'd love to drive an 08 McLaren MP423. That's a cool car. There's so many. But I'd just be, I'd be so rubbish. Do you know, uh, anecdote, I was at the Jordan factory in the early 90s. With when I was born. <laughs> yeah. Um, with uh, musician Chris Rear. Oh, yeah. Who happened to be a. Driving gift, home for Christmas. He, well, we weren't driving home for Christmas, as it happens. <laughs> at, or staying in. A, we weren't staying at a local auberge either. Yes. Uh, but uh, we. I can't even remember why we were there. But we were. And he was good mates with Eddie Jordan. And Eddie Jordan had let Chris drive that year's or the previous year's car, just a handful of laps at Silverstone. I, so I said to Chris, well, how, how was that? How did you find that? And he said, well, the most phenomenal thing was I did five laps, six laps, and I didn't touch the brake pedal once because of all the downforce from the aero. You take your foot off the throttle and the car just stops. So for, for, more, you know, for mortal people, you don't need the brakes. You, you, know, you come off the gas, the downforce just slows the car down. So, you know, what, what, what I was discussing with him all those years ago was how much faster the Formula One drivers have to be going in order to not just need the brake pedal, but need every single minuscule ounce of braking power that they can deliver. I just think, um, when you think the cars of today, they're going around Silverstone and they don't, well, if, if you're thinking about starting from the old layout, they don't touch the brakes until Stowe. Um, and I'm really happy to admit that that would cause me to redecorate the cockpit with all sorts of fear. Um, it's just, it's terrifying. I mean, can you imagine going flat through the compl through cops? Flat? Yeah. No. Yeah. And maggots. And do, do I want to? No. No. <laughs> um, but no, it's a, yeah, it's incredible feats of engineering. No, they they earn their money, those boys. And uh, talking of men that earn their money doing d d dangerous things, we mentioned him earlier, Nigel Mansell. We are pretty lucky, aren't we? Because we've got him out here this weekend. But dream guest. Dream guest. But we've managed to get Nigel Mansell, which is I know. incredible. And so, uh, what what are you going to ask him? I'm going to ask him how long it takes him to grow his moustache. I think it's just something that happens on cue, and it just it arrives. The rumour is is that he grows his moustache very, very quickly. To, for me to grow a Mansell quality moustache would probably take 25 years. He can sort of knock it out in four hours. So I want to get to the bottom of that. It's um, it's the density that's the the thing that we that we rec that we aspire to have. You don't have. I I, I have a pencil, um, which makes me look really creepy um which is why i avoid it but he looks fantastic did you see vettel's mustache i did i actually like that did i thought you? it was a great look oh, i really i thought he i thought it was a fantastic look <laughs> he should he should bring it back and he's a huge mansell fan he's a is massive he? mansell fan yeah ah, okay um, didn't know that but yeah no we're very excited to have him we're very lucky well you will well, i i want to know about his massage what do you want to know about i'd just like to hear the stories um, and hear the stories of all the cars, um, what it was like, uh, you know, the politics, um, yeah, and the wrestling, wrestling a car like that around the track. Well, he's going to join us after the break, so uh, we're going to take a short break now, but uh, please uh, stay right where you are because we'll be back with Nigel very shortly. <laughs> So welcome back to our podcast, everybody. And uh, today, as we mentioned a little bit earlier, we have got Nigel Mansell as our guest, and we've managed to drag him away from his uh, Formula One cars, which are behind me, and he's gonna come and just say a little bit about that. And I think, Felix, you are the man that's going to be ask pro asking the probing questions of Nigel. I'd like to start with the Hungarian Grand Prix 1989. He qualified in 12th place. What happened in the morning for you to then go out and just destroy the whole field? What happened? It was, um, it was truly uh, fantastic. We, we, we suffered understeer with the car through the whole 
practice and, and qualifying and it was, um, it was actually quite upsetting I have to say. I was about a second and a half off the pace and uh, Maurizio Nardon, my engineer with Ferrari, a fantastic guy, and I, um, we just put our heads together on the uh, Saturday evening and said, look, you know, we, we need to do something with the car to give us you know, more downforce on the front of the car. And, and we made some Mickey Mouse ears uh, for the front wings, which uh, John Barnard wasn't very happy about. But we went for the warm-up, and I was a second and a half quicker in the warm-up than my qualifying. And that was on fuel, too. So we, we knew we'd, we'd discovered something which was pretty good. And it was essential. It's essential on slow circuits uh, to get a great start because there's very little overtaking opportunity at uh, Hungary, except for the main straight. And so um, I think I took seven cars on the stars. I decided to go around the outside on the first corner, which is dangerous because if there's anything happening on the inside of the track, everything gets booted to the outside. If you're on the outside and someone comes and hits you, you're off the circuit. But I got through the first corner really well. And then it was a question then of building momentum and getting a place every few laps. And, and then obviously uh, there was a tremendous fight between the late great Etten Senna and myself. And, uh, I did a fantastic manoeuvre, he came up, he lost his, con Ayrton doesn't normally lose his concentration, but I think he got distracted when he was behind the money run of uh, Stefan Johansson, and I managed to box him in, and it was fantastic because he had nowhere to go except trying to cause an accident with me, and I, I got past him, and you know, fairy tale ending, I won the race from 12th, it was one of the best wins I think of my career. Uh, Ferrari was ecstatic, I was ecstatic, and uh, Maurizio was, the fans were. It was uh, one of my greatest wins in Formula One. Well, speaking of um, your greatest wins, there's, there's, there's been a few moments, particularly with these cars that are being auctioned tomorrow, which ha these cars have involved some of your finest moments in your career. Um, and we were talking about it yesterday at dinner. Um, but the first race of the year was arguably the most surprising. Um, why don't you tell us a little bit about that? It was absolutely astounding. I mean, you, you join a new team and obviously your first race is, is pivotal because everyone's, their eyes are on you. You know, Ferrari had a lot of hype. Uh, I got on really well with John Barnard and I had a great race engineer then as well with Maurizio. Um, but the biggest problem we had for the whole winter testing was reliability. It was the first era of the semi-automatic gearbox and the gearbox kept breaking down. And that weekend we, we qualified sort of so-so, it wasn't great. Um, but then in the warm-up to the race, which I think is the most important part of the racing years ago, it gave you a few laps to settle the car down, check the tyres out and make sure you had a balance to the car because we used to have to balance the car ourselves. We didn't have sort of 30 to 50 engineers doing everything for us. And um, I did four corners in the warm-up and the car stopped on the side of the track, right opposite the big grandstands and uh, the Brazilian fans were really enthusiastic because of obviously the, um, uh, the challenging with uh, Nelson Piquet and Etten Senna. So they were wishing me well, throwing me bricks and throwing me water and throwing me cans and, and all the rest of it. And I was sitting there going, I'm really pleased I booked an early flight home because I I said to the captain of British Airways, there's an earlier flight at like 3.30, 4 o'clock in the afternoon. I'll get the earlier flight home when the car breaks down within a few laps. So anyway, the race comes, it starts, we get a good start, we're, we're there. And sure enough, within three or four laps, Gerhard Berger, my teammate at the time, is on the side of the circuit down the main straight. And there's steam and everything coming out of the car, the car blown up. And I went round and round again, and it was about the fifth or sixth lap. And I overtook you know, a couple of cars, and I think I was in fourth or fifth place at the time. And I was thinking, well, how many laps is it going to be before the car breaks down? And, um, and then another few laps went by, and I was up into fourth and up into third. And I was getting angry in the car, going, the car's going really well, it's going to break down on me. And I was going, please don't break down. <laughs> please don't. And then I was in second place, and I was thinking, this is not going to be a good day. I mean, normally you're really happy if you're in second place and catching the leader. And so I caught the leader, passed the leader, then I was in first place. And I was angry as hell. I couldn't believe why I was so angry because the anticipation of waiting for the car to break down. And I got halfway through the race and I was thinking, well, please keep going, please keep going. I was talking to the car and trying to encourage the car to keep going. And then uh, just a few laps before the, the pit window, our pit window, I was going down the main straight you know, urging the car to, you know, be reliable. And the steering wheel came loose in my hand. And, you know, it felt like it dropped in my lap. 
and they've got three bolts and screws in the steering wheel that holds it onto the rack and a couple of them, well they all came loose and of course I had dead moments in the steering wheel which frightened me to death because at 200 miles an hour you don't want any movement in the steering wheel so I came in the pits a few laps early and screamed I need five wheels and tyres, four wheels and tyres and a new steering wheel, the steering wheels come loose I need a new steering wheel! <laughs> and so we made a pit stop, four wheels and tyres and the steering wheel went out and then by, I don't know, destiny, good fortune, I mean, just inspirational luck, the car kept going and we won the race and it was sensational. And it was races later before we had the right reliability to, to finish another race. So to win the first race with Ferrari, to be able to dedicate it to the late Enzo Ferrari who just died previously a couple of months before, because I was the last driver to be signed by him, it was all, all surreal. It was fantastic and uh, a wonderful feeling to come straight out of the box and win the first race. So, and that's the car over there. So it's truly magnificent. C can I ask a quick question? Because anyone that's ever, any interview I've ever heard from a Ferrari driver says, they say that there is a level of pressure that they feel as a Ferrari driver that they you don't really experience in any other team. And, and so did you, from the moment you signed, sort of leading through to that first race, did you feel a big weight of expectation or wasn't that really the case? Everybody knows who's driving for Ferrari. When they win a race, all the, all the bells throughout the churches in Italy ring. You know, the Pope comes and visits the factory for crying out loud. So the expectation of a Ferrari driver is just absolutely astonishing. And so to win the first race for them just cemented my relationship with Ferrari, the fans and Tifosi. And so we just had a wonderful time. And they came up with a name for you, didn't they? Ileone, yeah, the Lionheart. Yeah, yeah. it's brilliant. Yeah. And that's, that's stuck, hasn't the it? The fighter, yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Speaking, um, there's so many moments involving this, the, the Ferrari that we could, we could question you about. Um, we, we could spend hours. Um, but I've, we, what we can't forget is there is also an amazing car opposite, and that's the Williams FW14, um, which is very famous for being the center taxi car. Yep. But there's another moment which I'm not sure has been brought up yet, which is the footage at the Spanish Grand Prix as you overtake Ayrton Senna. Um, obviously these cars are incredibly dangerous, <laughs> Nigel. Um, do you feel, looking back, that it was maybe um, irresponsibly close to the other car? I think, I think what was really funny was the build-up to the Spanish Grand Prix. I was, I was called by the national papers uh, what do you, a triathlete because um, it was on the Friday night or um, Saturday. We had a football match with the press and I ended up in hospital with a second and third degree sprain of the ankle. And so it wasn't really good. And then in driver's briefing, it was so funny the next day, Gerhard Berger um, kicked me in the ankle. And anyway, long story short, he, he fell on the floor because I, I hit him in the solar plexus, which I said, don't do that again. He kicked <laughs> you in the ankle on purpose. <laughs> yeah. And uh, <laughs> he's very playful. And uh, anyway, everybody, the FIA stewards were all looking what the hell's going on and all the rest of it. And then. Then there was a big punch up between Etten and I, uh, not physically but verbally uh, in the stewards room because I said, uh, Jean-Marie Balas, can you please explain to me why there's rules for everyone here and exceptional rules for one person, which was Etten. Etten took the bait and he went and he was on the rev limiter. <laughs> And so, we were, and I just sat back in my chair, and it was so funny to see out and go off on one with Jean Marie and all the rest of it. So then we took all this, uh, shall we say, um, controversy on the circuit, and we were racing head to head. And so coming down the circuit, uh, straight, uh, 200 odd miles an hour, and, and we were we were li li testing one another, you know, because Etten wouldn't back out, and I wouldn't back out. And one of us did in the end, which he hadn't had to. But uh, yeah, it was uh, it was great, great TV footage, wasn't it? It was fantastic, and that's the car. And then, of course, at Silverstone, um, when I won the race, um, it, was, it was what was amazing with winning the race was it reminded me of Rio with uh, with the Ferrari. That I was opposite the fans, and the fans are very passionate about their own. Uh, drivers and they were giving me a hard time and I could see the English fans were giving him a little bit of a hard time and I thought ah oh, pick him up you know and so I pulled over and he jumped on the car and he he kicked the marshal away and and then I must admit it went through my mind on the way back shall I go up to 200 miles now and pull 5g around the corners and fly him off <laughs> but I didn't because I'm a gentleman <laughs> so I gave him a lift back and uh, 
yeah, we, we had a great relationship. Looking back and uh, and comparing the two cars, which was the which was the car that you preferred to drive, or was more satisfying of the two? I, I think I think any car you win in is something incredibly special. I, I think there's no question for me the Ferrari, winning first time out in it, changing teams uh, to a complete new lifestyle, new language. Um, Ferrari was something incredibly special. That's not to um, not say the Williams was as well because the, the Williams was an outstanding car but it's just the memories and the and the special um, acceptance I had within the community and within the country of Italy was was just magnificent and there's a there's another single seater which is in the lineup tomorrow which is the GP Masters car which was a great series uh, in the mid 2000s for champions of, of, of the past and, and amazing drivers um, and it's a shame that we don't have a series like that today um, because it was a brilliant series um, but again it seemed like you it, it seemed like you had a different car because no one else could come close oh well that's not strictly true there was a lot of cars that came close but we uh, we had a thirst uh, I like winning but what was so funny about Qatar was um, we had a full start so we had to stop and it was 50 degrees and we were all, shall we say, mature drivers and we had to prehydrate to drink litres of water and electrolytes and everything for the race because we were all farts in a, in a car in, in tremendous heat on the circuit and when they had a full start and a delay, what was so funny, everybody was going to the bathroom because you needed to be in the car to sweat it off and then we got in the cars again and then there was another delay. Ah, oh, it's the most difficult start I think any of us have ever had, but wonderful and, and we managed to win the race just. Um, we had Emerson and a few others breathing down our necks. And then the first race, of course, with the cars was in South Africa, which was fantastic, except for the first two days of testing, I was, I was two seconds off the pace. I know, you know, you say the car, I had the best car and all the rest of it, but for two days, I was, what am I doing wrong? I changed the springs, I changed the dampers, we changed everything, changed the aerodynamics. I couldn't go any quicker changing the roll bars. I couldn't go any quicker and I was second and a half, two seconds off the pace. And then I realized there was one thing I didn't change. So I put a new pair of tires on immediately two seconds a lap quicker. So you can, you can work as hard as you want. If you've not got the right boots on the car, not got the right tires, and the tires I had, although they were brand new, they weren't working. They were not a good set of tires. So I got another new set of tires, put it on, of course the car was quick then. So, but it's tough. It was a reminder, you have to get everything right. It's, um, it's amazing watching the clips, um, particularly the race with your, yourself and Emerson. Um, and it looks like you're just, D despite the fact that everyone you know, was, was in the latter stage of their racing career, nothing had changed. No. You, you approached every, same, every yeah. corner with the same uh, ag commitment, aggression, yeah. uh, and it's amazing to watch because you were driving so beautifully um, and had such a commanding, uh, commanding way of doing the track. The, the, the amazing thing in South Africa, Emerson was quicker than I was. At the end of the race, he gave me a hard time. I, mean, I, was, I was really trying to hold him back and I was having to brake a little bit longer in certain places where I knew he couldn't overtake to slow him down. So then get on the accelerator early enough that I could just get two car gap that he couldn't slipstream me to overtake. But he drove fantastic. I mean, Emerson, a great driver that he is anyway, but that first race, he was super quick. We are, we are so excited about the sale tomorrow. There's huge interest uh, globally and it's such a rare opportunity to have a, a collection of cars come from the champion. Um, having really, have, none of these cars have really turned a wheel since the day they they finished their race. I think the most incredible thing, honestly, is both these cars are pristine. There's not a scratch on them. Nothing's been broken on them. You know, the Ferrari is over 30 years old, and it's pristine as it came off the circuit, winning the last race in Hungary. That is the car, and it's not been run, and it as is completely. So it's the most genuine car you could buy. And what advice would you give to someone, uh, the, the next owner, if they were going to drive it? Uh, do you know, if, if you've got the finances, pay enough to buy it, <laughs> first of all. Spend the money, get it running, 
and enjoy it. It's a fantastic car to drive. It really is a fantastic car, and, and they'll they'll enjoy it like there's no tomorrow. So if, if if they got either of those cars running again, and they invited you to come and do a few laps, would you be up for it? For a certain figure, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> it's. Uh, brilliant that you entrusted the cars to uh, RM Sotheby's to sell and we're, they really have, are the stars of the show here and uh, amazing to have had uh, the picture of you with Ayrton on the side of the car as the cover image for our catalogue. We're really grateful to have you here and for you to spend a few minutes out of your day to come and chat to us. So um, it's, it's just lovely to be part of this and, and see the setting here and and what you've done and the build up to it, I must congratulate all of you and Sotheby's for all the hard work. But I mean, I, I just hope the cars go to a great home. I, I want the cars to go to a great home and then, then really appreciate whatever they spend. And even if it costs far more than they think it's going to be, uh, there's no question in my mind they've got an incredible appreciating asset as years go by. So uh, yeah, I just wish everybody well tomorrow. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Thanks, Nigel. So thank you everybody for joining us for another episode of RM Sotheby's Car Show uh, from here at our auction in Monaco and uh, next week we will be back again from Monaco but with another special guest so look forward to seeing you then. Mm -hmm.